video 32 of the master course quantum chemistry of molecular electromagnetic properties. The topic of this lecture is the magnetic multipole expansion. This lecture is a, in a way a repetition of the lecture on the electric multipole expansion. However, there are significant differences from the electric case. In the electric case, we were dealing with the charge density, which is a scalar field. Here, we are the corresponding property we are looking at is the current density, the current density of a dynamic system of charges, meaning a char system of charges which are moving, charges which are moving with a velocity v here. So we have um, still our um, charge density uh, with the corresponding velocity density for all the charges and the product of both is the so-called current density and the current density because the velocity is a vector field the current density is also a vector field so here the property uh, which we are looking at is a vector field compared to a scalar field which we had in the electric case correspondingly now where in the electric case we looked at the electrostatic potential, we now look at the vector potential. So the corresponding potential here for the magnetic case is also a vector again. It's the vector potential coming from this um, current density here. The expression is apart from uh, something conserved with the units, completely analogous to the electric case. That is, by the way, something to do that um, they both together, the three components of the vector potential here with the scalar electrostatic potential together form a four vector of uh, the potentials of the charge and current densities. Now again, like in the chapter for the uh, electric multipole expansion, this uh, expression here, although it's uh, exact, is not really convenient uh, to use, at least for, for our purpose, because in order to evaluate the vector potential at different observation points, one has to carry out the integration for each point in U. So we will do like in the electric case, we will use the same Taylor expansion of um, here one over the distance between the observation point and our integration point. Now inserting therefore now this Taylor expansion which we had in, in the last chapter, uh, here in the expression for the vector potential, we get these terms here. I cut off the expansion one term earlier, so we were not we we're going to discuss one term less than in the electric case, which is related to the fact that the magnetic dipole terms are often of the same importance as the electric quadrupole terms and therefore less important than the electric dipole terms but they are they are at the same level of importance uh, and therefore we also include here now them we only include the magnetic dipole term and not the magnetic quadrupole term which would then be one order of uh, importance less so here we have now integrals over this current density here over a component of the current density alone because I mean we are looking at one component of the vector potential so we have here the corresponding component of this current density and here we have uh, in a way a first order moment of this current density um, here a particular component the alpha component of the current density and the beta component of uh, our uh, position vectors now let's look at those uh, integrals more. Our magnetic multipole expansion, which included in particular precisely this integral over a component of the current density. This one is zero in our expansion here. Had this uh, um, product of one component of the current density and then a component of these vectors here, position vectors. And, um, but that's not a symmetric expression, though we have alpha and beta there. Now, such an 
asymmetric expression can of course be written as the sum of the symmetric one where we have alpha and beta plus beta and alpha and uh, the antisymmetric one with the minus sign. Here on the first page in this expression, write that as the sum of the symmetric and antisymmetric contribution to it. And for that, we want to make use of an expression from normal vector calculus, um, which allows us to derive, I mean, in particular, the divergent theorem of vector calculus allows one to derive this relation here for an integral over the current density, over a current density, and some gradient of an arbitrary function. So that's an f is an arbitrary function, and here we take the gradient of the arbitrary function. If that's just a scalar function, the gradient is then a vector function. So we have here the dot product, the scalar product of this gradient of an arbitrary function with the current density and integrated over the full space. This is zero, and we're going to use that now uh, a few times. Let's, for example, and this this uh, relation uh, is correct if we are dealing with a steady current distribution, and a steady current distribution is one which divergence is zero. And what does steady current distribution mean? I mean, it essentially means that uh, we are not losing charges. So if you look at our molecule and we have uh, um, a current density or current distribution in a molecule. Um, so the molecule is not leaking charges, so it's not losing electrons or, or gaining electrons, which that would the case that the, it would not be a steady current distribution. That we can uh, safely assume for our systems. Now, if you, for example, choose as the arbitrary function here, uh, R alpha, so the alpha component of a position vector, then of course uh, um, the gradient of this function is then zero for the beta and for the other components then the alpha component, for the alpha component it gives one. So here this integral with the scalar product of the gradient of this arbitrary function and the current density then reduces just to an integral over the alpha component of the current density. And as the divergence theorem of a vector calculus tells us, this integral is zero. And of course, this integral is still zero, which means the first term in. Now, this has an important consequence because that integral of the current density corresponds in the electric case. That was the integral of the uh, charge density, which was the total charge of the molecule. And one could also call the monopole of the uh, the electric monopole. And here in the magnetic case, this magnetic monopole um, is zero. So uh, magnetic monopoles don't exist. Now the next term, so let's look at, again, our, our integral here from uh, divergent theorem. And let's look now at a function which looks like this. So taking the gradient of this function, then because this is a product here, we get two terms and we get one term where we get uh, um, a beta alone and one where we get our alpha alone and correspondingly then alpha beta for the other, which means inserted this function inserted up here in that integral leads to this integral. And that is still zero. And that means that this symmetrized product of a component of the current density and some other component of this vector here, symmetrized because here we have beta alpha and then we have alpha beta here, that is zero. And that means if we, then the symmetric one disappears. So I've written it here again. So if you write that as sum of symmetric and antisymmetric, the symmetric one disappears and we are left with the antisymmetric one which we then uh, can combine here and can write it for not a component of the vector potential mayor, but we can write it for the vector potential as a vector. So we can write whatever was on the underneath the integral as this double cross product of uh, these three vectors. 
Now we can do two more things. Um, this term here does not depend on our integration variable, which is small r, so we can take that out of the integral, which means we are left over uh, with the integral here of this uh, cross product of our current density and uh, these position vectors. And uh, we have still the one half in front of it. And this integral, one half, this integral of the cross product of the position vector and the current density is the magnetic dipole moment, or it's the first magnetic moment. So it's complete analogous to the uh, electric first moment. This is the magnetic first moment, where the electric moment was just a, a product of a vector times the charge density. But here we have a current density, which is a vector, and therefore we get also here now a cross product. And inserting the current density, uh, current density meaning writing in the charge density times the um, velocity distribution, uh, we can write it like this. So this is the magnetic dipole moment of uh, a system with moving charges. And therefore we can write the vector potential, the, the first surviving term of the vector potential of this current distribution as the product of the magnetic dipole moment from this current distribution and this combination of uh, position vectors. R here, uh, that's again, that is our expansion point for the uh, multipole expansion, uh, the expansion of the one over uh, R term, which we had in the original expression for the vector potential. And um, for a reason which becomes clear later on, now we call it uh, the gauge origin, not just the origin as we did in the electric case, but the gauge origin because this uh, expansion point later on will get uh, another significance. However, as this is the first term in the expansion and the magnetic dipole moment is the first moment, there is no magnetic monopole moment, the magnetic dipole moment um, is again actually independent of this gauge origin. So we can, because we can split this integral up in, in two integrals and then take the R, the gauge origin, out of the integral. And then we are left again with the integral over a component of the current density. And that we argued before was zero. So the magnetic uh, dipole moment is actually independent of this uh, gauge origin. So this is the magnetic moment coming from moving charges. Closed shell molecules actually don't have such a moment, not a permanent magnetic dipole moment. Uh, they get a, can get a reduced uh, magnetic dipole moment. We'll come back to that in uh, later lectures. But they don't have permanent magnetic moments. On the other hand, open shell molecules, uh, they can have uh, permanent magnetic moments. And that will lead to, to paramagnetism. Paramagnetism coming from uh, orbital angular momentum motion. Then, of course, all particles which have spin, they have also magnetic moments. But the expression for those magnetic moments is not given by these expressions. This is magnetic moments coming from motion of charges, whereas the magnetic moment of, of spin uh, is not a question of uh, motion of charges through space. <laughs>